afternoon. This is All About Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things questions and markets related to Bitcoin, little b for the currency, and Bitcoin, big b for the network, a collective journey to understand, apply, and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. And I'm your host, Christine Lee, looking forward to my interview with Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy, coming up. But first, let's check in on Bitcoin. The Coinus Bitcoin price XBX index is currently trading at 39,777. Bitcoin's weaving in and out of $40,000 today. It's up about 6% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as a leader in crypto news events and data. Taking a look at our top stories, the chief of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration saying Monday, the multinational bank will offer El Salvador technical assistance to implement Bitcoin as legal tender. Executive President Dante Mosey saying the move would offer Salvadorans opportunities such as lowering the cost of sending money abroad to family members. Meanwhile, Tanzania's president also urging the Bank of Tanzania to prepare for wider adoption of crypto around the world, saying the bank should, quote, be ready for changes and not get caught underprepared. Meanwhile, hedge fund manager Paul Tudor Jones telling CNBC he wants his portfolio to have an allocation of 5% to Bitcoin. PTJ discussed the potential implications of Fed Chair Jerome Powell's insistence on characterizing the recent acceleration in inflation, the fastest in 13 years, as transitory. Tudor Jones adding he would, quote, go all in on the inflation trades if the U.S. Federal Reserve remains indifferent to rising consumer prices. And Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting Sunday that the car maker will start accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment provided miners use renewables to power at least 50% of their operations. The price of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies soaring after the tweet. Musk also reiterated that Tesla has only sold 10% of its Bitcoin holdings to confirm that BTC could be liquidated easily. And finally, MicroStrategy announcing Monday it's preparing to buy up to $488 million in Bitcoin with the proceeds of a $500 million bond sale it just completed. The business intelligence firm adding that it, it's approximately 92,079 BTC is being held by a newly formed subsidiary, MacroStrategy LLC. CEO Michael Saylor has made Bitcoin acquisition a second mandate for his 32-year-old company after its main business of developing software. And joining us now to discuss is MicroStrategy CEO, Michael Saylor himself. Hello there, Michael. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. All right. Congratulations on this latest raise. You're using the proceeds to buy more Bitcoin. So a lot of newcomers to the space always ask, is now the right time to buy? Well, we, it's always the right time to buy. We have a long term view on this. I think that this is the decade of Bitcoin. This last decade was the um, was the first decade of Bitcoin, and and uh, it reached multi hundred billion dollars by March of 2020. But I think the pandemic catalyzed the next phase of growth and caused it to mature and come to the attention of institutional investors. And so I think the coming decade is, is the decade when institutions, corporations, governments, and, and the like begin to adopt Bitcoin. Mm -hmm as a, a digital asset. Michael, why create macro strategy to hold the BTC? I see this is a new subsidiary of yours. When we did the bond financing, we, um, we agreed that we would pledge the Bitcoin that we purchased as part of the, um, the debt proceeds as collateral against the loan. But uh, we had 92,000 other Bitcoin and there was no reason for us to collateralize the $500 million financing with billions of dollars of additional Bitcoin. So uh, we kept that out of the collateral package. We moved it into its own separate subsidiary because uh, that increases our flexibility over time. Is there any concern in raising this much debt to buy Bitcoin, which is a very volatile asset? Well, I think tomorrow I'll run a survey on Twitter and I'll ask everybody in Twitter over the next seven years whether they think Bitcoin will go up more or less <laughs> than 6.15% per year on average for the next seven years. And then we'll let them decide. <laughs> Fair enough. So you're raising the debt to buy Bitcoin. I, I just wonder, who are these investors buying senior secured notes for 6% annual interest when they can just buy Bitcoin? 
Well, they can't buy Bitcoin because they have uh, investment funds and the, and the charter of the investment fund is to invest in corporate debt. So their choice is to buy corporate debt for microstrategy that's backed by Bitcoin and also backed by the cash flows and the intellectual property of an enterprise software company and get paid 6.15% interest. Or they could buy corporate debt from another company, uh, approximately our size, but only get paid maybe 4% interest, and they would not be collateralized by Bitcoin. Or they could buy the corporate debt of an Apple computer or a bigger company and get paid 2% interest. So they're actually uh, investing in a debt instrument that's collateralized by Bitcoin and cash flows that's got a much larger yield than other choices they might have. Would you say buying these notes or even buying MicroStrategy stock is an expensive way to gain Bitcoin exposure? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say that if you have the charter and the ability to buy Bitcoin, you could buy naked Bitcoin and you get the all the volatility of Bitcoin. If you have uh, an investment fund and your charter is to invest in publicly traded equities, you can't buy Bitcoin, nor can you buy convertible debt, nor can you buy debt. And so if you were to buy MicroStrategy, you would be buying a company that's a blend of an operating software company <clears throat> with a leveraged Bitcoin position. That would be different than buying an ETF because an ETF wouldn't have an operating business to sweep cash flows into Bitcoin, and it wouldn't be a leveraged Bitcoin position, and you couldn't do the sort of things we've done like okay. like issue debt for 0% coupon. I mean, you can't do that with an ETF. If you have a convert fund, you could buy convertible bonds, but you couldn't buy equity and you can't buy Bitcoin and you can't buy senior debt. And if you have a, a, a corporate debt fund, you can't buy converts, you can't buy equity and you can't buy Bitcoin. So the world <laughs> consists of different investors. They have different charters. They have different limited partners. There are certain things they can do. If you want Bitcoin exposure, you might choose any of those as a rational decision. It depends upon your, your strategy and your charter. Fair, fair enough. Uh, switching on to some of the news items we have today, uh, Paul Tudor Jones saying that he wants 5% of his allocation in uh, his portfolio to be Bitcoin. And that's a response to the Fed's soft language on inflation. Does he have a reason to be concerned? And, and what are you watching out for at this week's Fed meeting? Six months ago, there was no inflation in sight, and we speculated that it might get to 2%, and when it did, uh, the Fed would do something. Then they changed the, the expectation to they would do nothing until it got over 2% for a long period of time. In the last month, it's, I think it's now 5%. And so we found inflation uh, by CPI standards. And so institutions have reason to be concerned about inflation between that and the commodity inflation, which is rampant. I think Paul Tudor Jones' message is a good one for Bitcoin. He's saying that he's upping his allocation from 1% or 2% to 5%. That's great. I think it signals that institutional adoption is coming. Uh, I think it's only rational to look for a monetary inflation hedge at this point. Interesting. Uh, we also hear from Elon Musk saying that Tesla will resume accepting payments in Bitcoin if Bitcoin mining reaches about 50% in renewable energy. A lot of Bitcoin maximalists just want Elon to go away, but you have his ear. You began the Bitcoin Mining Council with Elon's participation. What, what is your perspective? I thought it was awesome news because what he was saying was, first of all, we haven't, he hasn't sold any additional Bitcoin. He confirmed that they'd only sold the, the publicly disclosed amount. I thought that was bullish. He also indicated that, uh, that there are some circumstances under which he would continue to, to uh, accumulate or continue accumulating Bitcoin. I thought that was really a good message. I thought it was a message of support for Bitcoin. And I think if you combine it with uh, the latest China news, the hash rate on the network is down to 138 exahash, and there was a minus 5% difficulty adjustment down last period, and there's a targeted minus 4.9% difficulty adjustment coming. I think the implication is a lot of China hash rate that's running on dirty coal is being turned off and decommissioned. So, so there's a surge in, uh, in the energy mix toward renewables just in the past two weeks. And I think that once we sort out what that means, we'll conclude that uh, the network is migrating to the U.S. 
the network is decentralizing further, the difficulty rate has dropped, and that's great news for every existing Bitcoin miner outside of China. And for anybody that wanted to see Bitcoin become more sustainable and more carbon neutral, you know, we just saw 30 exahash, which is 20% of the network, which presumably was the coal burning 20% of the network in China, come off the grid. And so there's really, really interesting and, and positive developments here, I think, for mm -hmm. everybody in the Bitcoin industry. Michael, I wonder what is the status of the Bitcoin Mining Council presently? Um, we, uh, we have launched uh, the Bitcoin Mining Council and, and anybody can join. It's a voluntary and open forum and we've got lots of people joining right now. We're going to sponsor a Twitter Spaces meeting on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and anybody is invited to come and then we'll give you a big update on Bitcoin Mining Council. Okay. Very excited about it. And, and Michael, you're, you're based in Miami. Miami just had a big conference, uh, the Bitcoin Miami uh, conference a couple weekends ago. I wonder, what did you do in Miami during that time and what did you get out of it? I actually was only in Miami for a few hours for the conference. I, I, I did go there to speak. Uh, I was impressed with the enthusiasm of the entire Bitcoin community. Um, there's there's just a lot of passion in the community right now and uh i just never seen such strong morale and uh lots of really positive stories i think people are very charged up about what's going on in el salvador that was a big highlight i think uh, the developments in nigeria and tanzania are highlights i think that the news this weekend out of lebanon that the that, that lebanese have lost 90 percent of the value of their local currency and their dollar amounts or dollar balances are frozen by the banking system i think that punctuates just how important bitcoin is to the entire world and i think you could feel that passion in miami everybody feels like this is the idea whose time has come and we have an opportunity to spread property rights and human rights to 8 billion people around the world. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, El Salvador, of course, said that they are accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. More recently, the Central American Bank for Economic Integration is supporting El Salvador with technical assistance. And Tanzania's president is urging the country's central bank to prepare for global crypto adoption. So we are seeing this ripple effect. I wonder if you can expand on, on that. Well, I think um, what's clear is lots and lots of nations around the world are struggling and they need some kind of reserve asset like Bitcoin. Um, the United States dollar is spreading everywhere and El Salvador lost their own currency after the last civil war and they were using the US dollar as their medium of exchange. But they need a store of value and uh, they also need a way to move billions of dollars cross border without paying exorbitant remittance fees. And so I think what we can see in El Salvador is the future model of the 21st century uh, digital economy. And that would be billions of people with a digital wallet on a mobile device. And one of the things in the wallet is going to be a digital currency like the US dollar, probably running on a stable coin. And the other thing that's going to be in the wallet is a digital asset like Bitcoin. Bitcoin gives everybody in the world, and especially in El Salvador, the ability to save their money in an asset that's going to appreciate in value over time. And it's also providing uh, a worldwide settlement and synchronization network that allows uh, anybody in the world to plug their website, their mobile application, their bank into the global monetary network. And, they, and they're not forced to pay a 10% fee to move money back and forth or to wait days or weeks. And so mm -hmm. El Salvador is the model and uh, the enthusiasm and excitement here is because there are billion people, 1.7 billion people that are unbanked. They need the same thing. An Android phone that costs $50, a bank in their pocket, and assets that go up in value. Mm -hmm. I wonder what you think will happen to the U.S. dollar in the future amid this digital economic shift. I think the U.S. dollar is going to spread to 5 billion people. I think that the, this decade is going to see 
the explosion of the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world. It'll be the digital currency that'll be on every iPhone and every Android phone and every country in Africa and Asia and South America. And it'll move on Bitcoin rails. The Bitcoin open monetary protocol is what allows the U.S. dollar to spread to billions of people. In, a, in an inflationary environment, uh, money breaks down into two forms. There's a, a medium of exchange, we'll call it the currency, and that'll be controlled by governments, and the U.S. currency is going to be the most powerful one. And then you need a store of value, and that's an asset, and Bitcoin is the most powerful store of value on Earth. So Do you mean this I think has a Bitcoin central bank digital US currency? Spread together. Sorry? Do you, mean, uh, you, do you mean the digital dollar as in a central bank digital currency? or I mean that the U.S. dollar is going to spread to billions and billions of people on crypto rails. And in order for it to go to everybody in South America and Africa and Asia, it's going to need to be plugged into an open digital monetary network. And that network is Bitcoin. So okay. oftentimes people think that these things are in conflict. They're not. What you're going to see is the U.S. dollar and BTC, both of them spreading to billions of people because the world needs both. They need a medium of exchange that's compatible with payment networks and it's high speed. And they need but, a but store of we value. We see governments such as former President Donald Trump saying that Bitcoin is a scam. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren saying, you know, Bitcoin's too volatile. Stable coins are too dangerous. We need to create our own central bank digital currency, a digital dollar project. So how, how would that uh, interact? All of these are indicators that uh, the entire world's beginning to realize that Bitcoin is the most powerful technology of the decade. And they're just noticing now. But they I, don't I think, want to use uh, Bitcoin. World, what? But they don't want to use Bitcoin. They're just noticing now. There, but the truth is, what they realize is that there's eight billion people on the planet. Eventually, they'll all have a mobile device. They're all going to need uh, a currency on the device, and they're going to need an asset on the device. As as uh, the world comes alive they're going to realize that the only way that they can deploy digital currency to everybody on earth is with a digital asset and an open monetary protocol, and that is Bitcoin. So you're clearly a Bitcoin bull, but what are your thoughts on other crypto assets? Uh, you, you just see them augmenting uh, the, the, the centerpiece of the digital economy, which is Bitcoin. Is that, that's the sense I'm getting. You know, I think uh, they're, they all have uh, their own focus and, and it's a complicated world in, in the crypto sphere. So I am not an expert on the other crypto assets. Okay. I do think that Bitcoin is, is uh, in fact, the most uh, powerful dominant digital property on earth. And I think that it's, it's essential if you're going to spread digital currency and digital assets to billions of people. Okay. Michael, always a pleasure to hear from you and sharing your thoughts. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. All right, that was MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. All right, Bitcoin's option smile shows persistent fears of a deeper drop and low expectations for a quick rally. While Bitcoin is climbing on comments by Tesla CEO Elon Musk that the electric car maker would accept Bitcoin uh, crypto transactions on the condition of more clean energy use by miners, that has failed to calm market fears when looking at this chart pattern known as the option smile, which shows relatively higher implied volatility or demand for options at strike prices below Bitcoin current market price than the implied volatility for higher strike prices for contracts expiring in July. The unique structure speaks of extreme fears and continued demand for downside hedges as investors continue to buy puts, which is the right to sell Bitcoin at a certain price in anticipation of a more profound price decline. And joining us now with more is Compass Mining Research Director Zach Vole. Welcome, Zach. Also a former uh, Coindesker. Good to have you on the show. Good to be here, Christine. Thanks for having me. All right, Zach. So in response to Elon Musk, I saw that you tweeted, absolutely no one cares, plus an obscenity. But I know you have further thoughts that go beyond 280 characters. So what are your thoughts on Elon's latest comments on the whole energy mining debate? Yeah, 
That's definitely um, a topic of conversation that uh, inspires um, what you might call strong feelings from uh, certain people in the uh, crypto industry, um, specifically in the Bitcoin mining sector. It seems as though Elon, uh, through Tesla, acquired a significant size uh, of Bitcoin, a significant amount, um, and then sort of after the fact is now trying to understand the industry uh, that he sort of invested in um, through Tesla. And uh, that learning process seems to be taking quite some time for him, um, which in my opinion, maybe should have taken place before he made that investment. But he continues to harp on uh, sort of this narrative of, of dirty Bitcoin mining, um, which if anyone who takes the time to look at the status of Bitcoin mining right now simply isn't true. Um, I mean, of course, yes, a large portion of Bitcoin mining um, is power coal and other non-renewable energy sources, um, but also a significant portion of it is powered by renewable energy and increasingly large portion of it is. Um, and even portions of it that aren't powered by what may be strictly classified as renewable energy also have significant environmental benefits. Do we know um, how on, much of global mining comes from renewable energy? I think I saw something like 40%, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so that's that's in the, the, the correct sort of ballpark. Um, around 60 to 70% of Bitcoin miners use some sort of renewable energy in their, in their blend, uh, their energy blend. Um, and somewhere in the ballpark of 30 to 40% of Bitcoin miners are powered solely through renewable energy, um, which is a non-insignificant portion of Bitcoin mining. Um, but even zooming out a bit further, if, if one was to consider that Elon, whether or not Elon Musk actually considered a bit, uh, the environmental effects of Bitcoin mining or just sort of non-renewable energy production in general, he, he might think he would set his sights a little bit higher than the Bitcoin mining industry, given that it uses fraction of 1% of all, all uh, global energy production. Um, why he's so fixated on Bitcoin mining is a little bit uh, curious. Is Elon manipulating markets or does it concern you that one man has so much influence? Um, I think manipulating might be a little bit of a, of a strong word or sort of might have nefarious connotations. Obviously, the things he posts on Twitter moves the market, um, but whether or not he's he's trying to benefit from that is unclear, and I sort of have no opinions on that. Well, I, my guess I'll would say be that, that some people not, suggest that but, he's going to have this play where he's going to have all miners be incentivized to use his uh, energy credits or use uh, solar panels in some way. I think miners, for as long as Bitcoin mining has existed, miners only want one thing, and that's cheap. They're going to still want that one thing. So if Elon on offers them uh, very cheap energy, then obviously the incentive will be there for some miners to use uh, whatever product he's providing the energy for them. Um, but on cheap energy and some miners will uh, go a step further and sort of prioritize uh, renewable or green energy. Um, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, miners just want their power to be cheap. Cool. Zach, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Good. To, always happy to chat with you. Good. Thanks for staying. Glad to be here. All right. That was Compass Mining Research Director Zach Vol, And that's it for all about Bitcoin. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in New York for First Mover, your first look at the day's global crypto news headlines. You're watching Coindesk TV.